So good morning, good evening, or have a good night, depending where you are uh, in the world. Welcome to the sixth uh, Journal of Physiology Virtual uh, Journal Club, organized by the Journal of Physiology and the Physiological Society. It's a great initiative launched this summer with twice a month's discussion and a paper recently uh, accepted in the journal. So I am Fabien Brett. I will be hosting the session today. Thanks to the journal and the society for uh, this uh, invitation, and many thanks to uh, Rosie Ennard from the society for the organization. So today we're going to talk uh, on a paper in press about cardiac physiology, mainly at the cellular uh, level. Here is the outline of the session. So we are now in the introduction. Sorry. Up. I will then introduce uh, the panelists and why did I choose uh, this paper. Then uh, Josh Goldaber, the senior author of the paper, will present the rational uh, quickly in 10 minutes. The first paper, uh, Peter Kilfall, will then give us a presentation about uh, method, result, and uh, conclusion. We will uh, then have uh, for the journal Eleonora Grandi as an editorial uh, member of the journal, explaining why it was suitable for publication in the uh, Journal of Physiology. And then we will have a panel discussion and uh, answer to a question from all the panelists and the audience. So you can ask the question in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And next, for those who are uh, motivated, uh, we can have a network session all, all together and uh, have some uh, discussion, maybe for people who are uh, feeling lonely because of the lockdown nearly everywhere in the world. So a bit of advertising for the social media. I'm not very familiar with this, but you've got the Twitter, the Facebook, LinkedIn uh, link. So as I say, if you want to ask a question, use the Q&A box at the bottom uh, of the screen. The question will be answered uh, during the panel discussion. If you can provide your affiliation, that will be nice. Uh, if you prefer to send this anonymously, it's uh, what you prefer. You can just uh, tick a box. Don't worry, there is no uh, stupid uh, question. This session will be, uh, is recorded and will be available on YouTube in the next uh, few days. And you will have an email sending the link and a feedback survey that you can uh, fill, please. So now the panelists, um, uh, this is uh, Professor Joshua uh, Voldaber from uh, Los Angeles, Cedar Sinai uh, Medical Center. The senior author of the paper, Josh is a medical uh, doctor, and his uh, laboratory aims at understanding how cellular calcium regulates contractile and pacemaker function of the heart. During his career, he did a lot of work on sodium calcium exchanger, NCX. He created the first cardiac specific cow mouse for NCX, which uh, shows us that NCX is not essential for cardiac physiology. I'm kidding. He's also interested in heart failure since a very long time. He has a publication in the Journal of Physiology nearly 30 years ago. Next, uh, we have Peter Kilfall, the uh, first author of the paper. He did his PhD in the University of Louisville, investigating different ion channels using uh, electrophysiology. Here is an example of his publication from his uh, PhD. Then he did a postdoc in uh, Josh Lab, and this is uh, the topic of the current paper uh, today. And he moved to uh, sunny San Diego as a science, senior scientist at Pfizer, and is happy to discuss during the networking session and give us some clue how to switch from academia to industry. We also have, uh, for the Journal of Physiology, Eleonora uh, Grandi, Associate Professor at uh, UC Davis. She is trying to understand the cellular mechanisms of arrhythmia, like heart failure and atrial fibrillation, using mathematical models. She graduated from the University of Bologna in Italy. And she is currently an editorial book fellow of the G-Physio. And she will explain us what does this mean. 
And finally, me, uh, Fabian Brett, I'm research associate at uh, INSERM, working in Bordeaux, in the INSERM unit and the uh, Lyric Institute, led by Michel Esseguer. I spent 10 years in the UK, thanks to the BHF and the Wellcome Trust, four years in the USA, but I'm sure you have noticed that I have lost my BBC. I'm uh, focusing on uh, EC coupling in cardiac myocyte, and similar to uh, Eleonora, work, you know, trying to understand cellular mechanisms of arrhythmia in atrial fibrillation, ventricular fibrillation, but using uh, experiments, patch clamp, and confocal. I have also interest in uh, pollution and uh, arrhythmia, and I just got my first publication in the Journal of Physiology with my colleague from uh, Manchester. So why did I choose this paper as a physiologist? Here is a website from the society. We are trying to understand how the mechanism of living uh, things are doing. And it's an <coughs> example from the society website. And the Journal of Physiology has a long tradition of excellence in cardiac physiology. We can go back to the 19th century with uh, Sidney Ringer. Here is the original uh, recording of Sidney Ringer showing us that calcium, extracellular calcium, is essential for cardiac contraction. When I did the scan, and I arrived at the University of Leeds in 2000, going to the library and get the proper book to make the scan, I was very happy. For the little story, there was two publications, because after the first publication, Sidney Ringer realized that he was using pipe water instead of distilled water for this experiment. Of course, he blamed the lab technician for this. So a quick reminder about the cardiac uh, electrical activity using a paper by uh, Eleonora. So here you've got uh, the art with uh, four chamber, and the electrical activity depends on the region. We've got a long action potential with a plateau phase, depending on the region. And today we will focus on the working cells, the ventricular uh, myocyte. Here is a cartoon I did while I was in the UK showing a single ventricular myocyte where you've got imagination of the cell membrane called transverse tubule or T tubule, the major actor, L tap calcium channel, rhinodine receptor, calcium ATPS called CERCA, sodium calcium exchanger. Using the classic uh, drawing from uh, Don Bears, we get more details in the excitation contraction coupling. Here is a movie I did. You've got an action potential leading to the opening of the high tap calcium channel, a small calcium entry triggering further calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Here's the right in receptor. Calcium induced calcium release characterized by uh, Fabiato. The spatial temporal summation of this local events lead to uh, the global increase in calcium contraction and for the relaxation to occur, pumping back to the SR via the CERCA and removing from the cell via NCX. I have the chance to do a postdoc with uh, Clive Orchard at the University of Leeds. And we were working on uh, acute detubulation by uh, to investigate the physiological role, functional role of the T-tubule. Here you can see a control myocyte, a detubulated myocyte. And we show at the beginning of the 2000 uh, year that uh, T tubules are crucial for synchronous calcium release. We also quantify several ion currents, for example, the L tab calcium current really concentrated in the T tubule. Meanwhile, there was an explosion of data about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And in 2001, there was a work by uh, Tim Kemp from uh, University of uh, Madison, Wisconsin, showing that there is less T-tubule after heart failure. Here you can see a decrease of T-tubule density compared to control myocyte. And this is accompanied by a decrease in alta calcium channel uh, density recording using uh, charge movement. This was highlighted by an editorial by uh, Stephen Hauser and open new avenue of research. Of course, Jay Fiziol participated in this uh, discovery with a paper by uh, Bill Lowe, showing that it can be very quick in the decrease of density 
authentic of tubule during heart failure. We now have a pretty clear idea of the dysfunction at the cellular level for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And it is nicely presented and uh, extrapolated by Karin Cipido and David Eisner with defective EC coupling, decreased SR calcium content, decreased calcium uptake by CERCA, increased calcium removal by NCX. In addition, we've got the decrease in calcium in uh, T-tubule density, and of course, the leaky rhyolidine receptor by the work from Andy Marx. What about the other heart failure in clinics? We know that we have a preserved ejection fraction heart failure. As we say in French, this is the parent pauvre. The poor relative of heart failure, we don't really understand what's going uh, wrong. It's a bit like in the Magritte uh, painting, this is not a uh, heart failure. And to make some advance, we need some animal model. And Josh Goldaber, in collaboration with the Marban and Singalini lab, developed uh, an animal model of this type of heart failure in rat and show us that it's prone to ventricular fibrillation. So in today's paper, we're going to see the pathology physiological mechanism at the cellular level in terms of EC coupling. So it's highlighted today, but will be highlighted in print as well with a perspective by Bill Law and a real uh, journal club by Lauren Duran. So now we can switch to the presentation by George to have more details about the rationale for this. Thank you very much, uh, Fabian, and, and uh, I'm really honored that uh, this paper was chosen for discussion today. So I want to thank uh, you and the Physiological Society and the journal uh, for featuring this. And I will um, hopefully give you a reasonable idea in the next few minutes uh, about the background for this paper um, and why we chose to do uh, these experiments. I think you gave a perfect introduction and I may even repeat some of the things that you said. Um, so, so um, I'm going to put on my medical doctor hat for a moment and just say that um, uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or HEFPEF as we like to call it um, has all the signs and symptoms of the uh, heart failure that we're more familiar with, um, shortness of breath, uh, poor exercise tolerance, and so forth. Um, but the big difference is that if you measure the ejection fraction, it's preserved. Um, and uh, it has a very typical structural and functional abnormalities that you can see on uh, cardiac ultrasound or echocardiography, including increased left ventricular mass, left atrial enlargement, pulmonary hypertension, and then uh, very characteristic parameters of diastolic dysfunction, um, which can be measured uh, as mitral inflow changes and tissue Doppler changes. Um, as a clinical syndrome, there are risk factors for development of the diastolic dysfunction that might lead to HEFPEF. Um, and the ones that we most commonly know are things like age, coronary artery disease, hypertension, lipid disorders, uh, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, and metabolic syndrome, which has been getting a lot of attention um, in this disease. Um, there are also some non-cardiac risk factors, including kidney dysfunction, anemia, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And then over a period of time, we seem to develop uh, the actual clinical syndrome of HEFPEF. Now, what's remarkable about HEFPEF and why it's so important to study, as you called it, the poor relative of of uh, HEF-REF or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction um, or dilated cardiomyopathy is that um, when you graph the cumulative incidence of mortality of HEF-PEF and HEF-REF, um, they really lay right on top of each other. It's, it, it's pretty much exactly the same. So this is a very serious disease for uh, the world uh, because of uh, its high impact on mortality. Um, now, how do these patients die? Um, well, interestingly, um, depending on the different study, um, it's not always from a, a cardiovascular source. Um, there are plenty of non-cardiovascular uh, deaths in this population of patients, uh, but the cardiovascular deaths are very important. 
and uh, we need to understand exactly uh, why these are occurring. Um, the other thing that's been uh, uh, worthy of attention is, is the fact that um, women seem to uh, be particularly at risk for this disease. Um, and uh, there uh, might be a correlation with blood pressure um, in women that it leads to this disease, but also changes in hormone levels associated with uh, menopause leading to increased oxidative stress, inflammation, and maybe some microvascular ischemia. The other thing is that women seem to have more side effects to the medications that are used to treat a HEFPEF. Now, speaking of treatment, um, unfortunately, a treatment for HEFPEF has been dismal. There have been a number of trials uh, testing uh, nitric oxide donors, um, nitrates, um, acetic, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and receptor blockers, beta blockers, HCN4 blockers like evabradine, calcium channel blockers, and aldosterone antagonists. These are agents that are commonly used in treating HEFREF but they have apparently have no effectiveness um, in HEF-PEF. So we're, we're stuck with this problem that we have all these great treatments for HEF-REF and nothing for HEF-PEF. So what could we do? So you might think I'm from the United States and I'm going to reach for my disinfectant and bleach and my UV light and that I'm going to use this for HEF-PEF. Um, I'm going to uh, suggest that that might not be the best way to approach treatment of HEFPEF. Um, I think it's important in trying to think of a treatment, uh, we need to understand a lot more about the pathophysiology of the disease. And one thing that we do know and I want to mention is that the signature characteristic of HEFPEF is the diastolic dysfunction. And that can be seen uh, graphically if you plot left ventricular pressure against left ventricular volume in the two situations, in the normal situation and in HEFPEF. And you'll see that there is a, um, a, a great sensitivity to volume in this disease um, where you have a shift to the left and up for HEFPEF compared to normal. Um, that means that um, if you have a very low volume in HEFPEF, you have the risk of, of having exercise intolerance and low blood pressure. But if you have a high volume, um, you may end up with uh, dyspnea, pulmonary edema, and pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular overload. So this is the sort of the classic characteristic of HEFPEF that, that many people would be aware of. Um, what may be less notable uh, for folks is that there's uh, HEFPEF is associated with chronotropic incompetence, so a failure to increase heart rate during physical activity, and this can further impair cardiac output, and also systolic dysfunction. Um, the, the focus is so great on diastolic dysfunction that uh, it's, it's common to overlook the fact that uh, systolic dysfunction or failure to increase contractility during activity is present in HEFPEF. So these are some of the challenges with this disease that we need to be able to understand a little bit better. Um, now, the, the general sort of uh, overall overarching pathogenesis of myocardial dysfunction in HEFPEF has really been focusing most lately on the inflammatory uh, state, oxidative stress, vascular rarefication, and mic microvascular dysfunction, leading to reduced compliance uh, and myocyte remodeling and dysfunction. And the question then becomes, uh, what about abnormal calcium regulation in myofilament interaction? Um, so um, as, as Fabian uh, showed some very uh, nice studies on heart failure, here's one by uh, Alexi Zima and his colleagues uh, looking at the same thing. And the, the, really the point of this is not to go through this now, but that excitation contraction coupling has been very well studied in, in HEF-REF. Um, but much less known is known about the cardiomyocyte changes in HEFPEF. And so that's really what we were seeking out to do. Why are these systolic abnormalities? What's going on with the diastolic abnormalities? What is happening to intracellular calcium in, in HEFPEF? And unfortunately you can barely see, this is taken from a review article by Zyle and Gosh uh, about nine years ago. But there have been many uh, proposed changes in calcium regulation in diastolic heart failure or HEFPEF, another term for HEFPEF versus systolic heart failure. And 
Um, the problem with this kind of proposal is that it is not supported by much experimental work at the cellular level. Um, and the other thing um, is that it's very model dependent. A lot of the studies on HEF-PEF and dislock dysfunction have been done in aged rats, aged cardiomyocytes, and that might be a, a valid model for some um, situations, but maybe not generally for HEF-PEF. Um, the other thing is that many of the studies that have been done have not uh, bothered to phenotypically verify that the animals or experimental models had HEF-PEF. They simply look at diastolic dysfunction. So we think it's very important to make sure that we uh, phenotypically verify that these animals are actually sick. Um, so there are many models to choose from, aging models, metabolic syndrome models, hypertension models, kidney disease models. And our current favorite is this doll salt sensitive rat with induced hypertension, um, which has been around for a very, very long time. Um, all you need to do is feed this rat with a high salt diet for eight weeks. It will develop severe hypertension and 90% uh, of them in our hands will develop hyper HEFPEF hemodynamics and symptoms, uh, which in also include insulin resistance and a very high mortality. What's nice is you can give these same rats a low salt diet um, and um, they will be normotensive and have a normal lifespan. And uh, you know, a, a formative paper for me was a science paper that Ana Gomez uh, published about 20 years ago using this model to study heart failure uh, when it developed HEFREF, which some of them do. Um, so it's a, it's a great model, been around for a long time. And uh, the Marban lab used this model to show um, that uh, the HEFPEF animals develop fibrosis, which is shown here in this staining and in the summary graphs, and actually could be reduced by uh, treating these animals with cardiosphere-derived cells, um, not only in terms of the fibrosis, but in terms of the hemodynamics would improve um, as shown by echocardiography, and also the survival would improve. Um, and uh, Fabian showed this paper showing that, um, that HEFPEF, these HEFPEF animals uh, develop arrhythmia much more simply um, in a, a paper from uh, Eugenio Singolani's lab. We wanted to look, of course, at the calcium and EC coupling and couplons. Um, here's my cartoon, Fabian, uh, looking at the same thing. Um, and uh, we published a few years ago, but essentially just what you showed, the calcium comes in through the else type calcium channels, releases calcium from the ranadine receptors. This causes calcium spark that you can see uh, using confocal imaging with uh, um, a calcium dye such as FluO3 or FluO4. And one thing I wanna mention is this process occurs all along the T-tubules that you so elegantly studied for all those years um, and uh, that um, sets up a situation where we can follow the pattern. Um, here's the calcium sparks just looking individually, spontaneously in two dimensions. But you can do a rapid line scan, it's a technique that we like to use, to actually see how the sparks at each location that the T-tubules are activated, and we can calculate the probability of activation of these sparks at each location and the latency of activation compared to when we depolarize the myocyte. So um, that's the uh, introduction for uh, the paper. And um, I will then ask Pete to share his slides over mine and then um, he can show you what we found. All right, so uh, thanks for the background by Josh. That was great. Um, hopefully it puts everybody on. Um, you know, uh, understanding what we're uh, trying to do, what we're trying to do here. So um, I won't belabor any of these points, but just to uh, describe the model, um, you know, these doll salt rats, uh, we fed them high salt for 11 weeks. Um, and as Josh said, we see a lot of the, uh, the hemodynamic uh, response that is characteristic of HEFPEF in re uh, regards to uh, preservation of ejection fraction. Um, and then diastolic dysfunction um, by E to A and E to E prime ratio, and then dilation of uh, the left atrium. Um, the HEF-REF, uh, so we ligated them and followed them for six to eight weeks. Um, they had um, reduction in ejection fraction. Um, some of the uh, diastolic parameters were not as 
uh, significantly changed as you know we may have anticipated. But um, as a whole, you know, we do see a very divergent phenotype, especially uh, with respect to the um, contractility. Okay, so um, you know, trying to get a, sort of an idea of the general calcium handling in these cells, we um, took isolated uh, myocytes from uh, each rat group, and here we paste them. So this was uh, field uh, field pacing. And we see that there was um, a in HEFPEF uh, increase in the delta F, um, basically F over F naught um, in the HEFPEF group. Um, we saw a very slight reduction um, in HEFREF, um, you know, but uh, certainly we saw um, a more statistically significant increase. And a lot of that was driven by. Um, uh, elevation in the systolic, it appears it was driven a lot by the um, heightened systolic calcium levels. And you can see representative sort of uh, images up here at top. So uh, to summarize that, you know, we see uh, essentially that the calcium handling, um, systolic calcium was raised, diastolic calcium was raised in these HEFPEF cells. Um, so another set of experiments so in these experiments where uh, these were patch clamped cells where we're measuring calcium current, but uh, concurrently measuring uh, calcium transient amplitude. And so this is, you know, it's basically a similar type of experiment to the previous slide, but now we're introducing electrophysiology. Um, and um, so, you know, using a different approach, this was uh, done with flow four dye. And so um, again, we see uh, you know, the results were uh, similar to what we saw uh, using the FURA2, where we saw um, essentially an increase in the calcium transient amplitude and a non-statistically uh, significant increase in uh, calcium store. So those are like, uh, you know, kind of like global calcium uh, changes that are occurring. Um, as Josh mentioned, you know, our laboratory uh, has this uh, really, you know, kind of like a, a this ultra rapid line scanning, as we call it, um, that nice little animation Josh showed. And so when we do that at the, you know, at the capture rate that we're doing um, those line scans at 8,000 Hertz, um, we can begin to individually resolve the activation of uh, coupling units. So this uh, at top are, you know, representative images of what the output looks like. So we put that scan line across the cell um, and then we depolarize the cell with the voltage clamp stimulus. And what we saw here is, um, well, okay, well, if we're gonna compare the HEFREF to the control, we see what has been, um, you know, sort of what we expected. There was uh, areas where there was a uh, couple on, you know, couple ons failed to inactivate and that is kind of, uh, that you see by these uh, regions of blackness or delayed activation. And in the HEFPEF, to our surprise in a way, at least when we were initially making these recordings, um, they were you know, very much uh, similar to the control group. And then um, when I analyze, uh, analyzed them, it turns out that there was actually a, a narrowing of the distribution of the latency. So the latency is a measure between um, the time of the voltage clamp stimulus, and then when we can detect uh, basically a, a certain level of fluorescence here. And this was done all automated by a program that our, our lab had developed a while ago and published on. And so what we see, you know, what we can measure out of these recordings was, well, one was latency, which is just like the time milliseconds between uh, the depolarization and activation of uh, the coupling. Um, and then, you know, I further analyzed it. So what I did was um, essentially I could determine the timing of, you know, the, the time of each one of these uh, couplons. And so it's, you can't necessarily do that uh, very well by eye. So I uh, used a statistical analysis where I looked at um, the, time, the time to a certain fluorescence threshold at uh, two micron increments across the length of the cell. And so these were our length of recording is just about hundred microns. And then, so for each cell, then I got 
a uh, standard deviation of you know basically how much variation there was in the latencies for each one of those cells. And then um, the mean across the groups show that the uh, this what we call here the delta spark um, was actually significantly lower in HEFPEF, meaning that there was a more uniform activation of the couplons across the length of the cell, as opposed to HEFREF, where there was a lot more variability in the timing um, of each uh, couplon to activate. So of course that is very intimately related to the, you know, the anatomical structure of the uh, T tubules in the cell. Um, and you know, many papers before have linked that functional defect to the loss of T tubules, um, as Fabian and uh, Josh had mentioned earlier. So um, what I did was I took isolated cardiomyocytes and used a dye adenep stain and uh, labeled the surface essentially. And so what we saw here was um, we analyzed the T tubule density um, and T tubule um, sort of alignment using a program developed by um, one of our colleagues in Iowa, Long Shang San. And um, he, uh, or so in that analysis, we saw pretty strikingly that HEFREF as expected, we saw these sort of large patches of uh, loss of T-tubular arrangement. Um, and then in the HEFPEF, that T-tubule arrangement was well-maintained. And so that's one, uh, you know, it's a very sort of stark difference that uh, we observed. Um, and we think that that's uh, probably really important to the physiology, especially the calcium handling of these cells. Um, so, um, Further, uh, going back to what Josh had mentioned about uh, chronotropic incompetence and um, you know, lack of contractile reserves. So there had been a paper about a decade ago um, by Holly Norman and Nancy Schweitzer who looked at um, what would be considered HEFPEP patients um, and their response to uh, beta-energic uh, stimulation, um, dibutamine. Um, so sort of on like a cellular level, um, I was interested to see how these cells would respond to um, beta adrenergic stimulus. So um, it's been described before that HFREF cells um, have some uh, reduction in their response to say isoproteranol. And so we're interested to see what happens in these cells. And um, what we saw was despite having a uh, elevated, so, um, I didn't really get much into it before, probably should have, but so we saw that the peak calcium current density was elevated in HEFPEF compared to control. Um, and then, so this is in a completely different set of experiments, and we saw that, that um, it was similarly elevated here. Um, but then, you know, the window for increase uh, in response to isoproteranol um, was diminished. So in the control cells, we see almost like a, a doubling of the current density. Um, and then in the HEFPEF cells, that was much diminished. Maybe part of it's due to, you know, the, there was an elevated baseline there. Um, or maybe there's something much more complicated going on. Uh, similarly, um, the calcium transient amplitudes under uh, uh, field stimulation, there was uh, a much smaller response, non-statistically significant response here in the HEFPEF cells as compared to the, um, the, the control. So you can see most of the control cells uh, did a good job of increasing their calcium uh, transient amplitude in response to the ISO. And then um, on the, you know, the back end there, all that calcium has to be uh, you know, put back into the SR with each heartbeat. Um, so we were curious to see what uptake rates, um, if there was you know, potentially a disconnect between um, release and uptake. Um, and so similarly, we see a reduction in the ability uh, to accelerate um, calcium and being placed back into the SR. And so it's consistent up, uh, with the, you know, the systolic responses and it really points to some sort of defect in, um, well, something in the uh, beta adrenergic signaling pathway that is conferring that uh, external signal to either, you know, to the, these components of the EC coupling uh, machinery. Um, 
we looked a little more depth in depth into that. Um, so here we sort of apply the same technique that we use for uh, looking at couplon activation um, to look at um, calcium uh, transient relaxation, uh, uh, spatial, the, you know, the spatial uh, relationship of that. And we see that there was much more sort of uh, variability here in HFPEF cells, calcium reuptake uh, along the length of the cell compared to the control. And so, you know, there may be some significant defect in, um, or there's something going on significant with like, you know, the, the calcium uptake, um, whether, uh, you know, it's related to uh, the, you know, reorganization of the SR or of uh, the amount of proteins that are responsible for this. We're not totally sure because when we look at um, this last slide here, the basically a summary of the uh, protein measurements that we've done, we don't see any like super obvious standout uh, protein changes that will at least explain um, the uptake and um, uh, the release uh, responses to, uh, you know, either a control or um, under data stimulus. Uh, we do see that there is an elevated phosphorylation of the ryanium receptor at this 2808 residue. Um, we have unpublished data that show that these um, cells have uh, increased wave, uh, calcium waviness and sparkiness. So to summarize, I think what I would say is that we uh, set out to uh, describe this uh, uh, animal model of HEFPEF. We think that it recapitulates a lot of the, um, the human uh, phenotype. Um, and we think that, you know, diving deeper into some of these uh, changes that we see will potentially give us um, valuable information for uh, translating this, um, these findings to, you know, larger animals and ultimately to uh, humans. So that's it here. Um, I think we are ready for the next speaker. Thank you very much, Peter. So now it's uh, Ellie from UC Davis on the Journal of Physiology Board. Hi, thank you, Fabienne. Um, hi, everyone. It's a privilege to be discussing this excellent paper with Josh and Peter and you, Fabienne, and you all in the audience. As uh, was mentioned, I am an editorial board fellow um, I was selected about a couple of years ago to participate in this program that is offered by the Journal of Physiology to uh, allow junior investigators to gain editorial experience. And so, as you know, you, as you may know, the Journal of Physiology has a multi-tier review process whereby the um, uh, papers that are submitted get uh, handled by the editor-in-chief, Dr. Kim Barrett, and then she invites one of nine senior editors in various areas of physiology. And the senior editor then invites a reviewing uh, editor that is the person who um, does a preliminary assessment of the manuscript, invites reviewers and uh, summarizes the reviewers for recommendation for the senior editor. And so as an editorial board fellow, I had the privilege to serve as a reviewing editor under the guidance of several senior editors in the cardiovascular and modeling area. Um, and I'll be happy to talk more about this program uh, to anybody who's interested in the networking session. But my role uh, today is mostly to discuss what are the qualities of this uh, manuscript that really made it um, interesting for the Journal of Physiology. So it's been said already multiple times, uh, this uh, manuscript addresses a timely and important uh, um, question because HFPEF is a significant clinical entity for which there is uh, uh, no treatment yet. And this is actually what I'm gonna say to the medical students in a couple of weeks when we talk about uh, our failure drugs. So we have a, now an array of uh, uh, drugs that are used in systolic heart failure or uh, HFPEF. But really, uh, except for diuretics with the known uh, also kind of sex differences uh, in, uh, in safety of these, uh, of these drugs, there is really nothing that in the clinic can be used for uh, FPF. And the manuscript delves into um, <clears throat> the uh, fundamental mechanisms that are associated with uh, uh, changes in calcium handling 
that are uh, also then linked back to the half path phenotype. And these are na namely, uh, we have talked about them, the diastolic relaxation and the poor exercise tolerance or uh, chronotropic incompetence that uh, was talked about. And uh, by delving into, into these mechanisms, it definitely provides new insight into uh, the cellular molecular mechanisms and even, even ultrastructural uh, characteristics uh, of FPF. It does so by contrasting uh, FPF and comparing it with uh, a better known uh, entity that is uh, uh, FRF or systolic heart failure, for which the mechanisms for calcium handling or mishandling are better established. And the manuscript is also, of course, uh, uh, notable for its technical rigor. Uh, you have seen how it utilizes a broad array of uh, methods and approaches. It utilizes uh, clinically relevant animal models that are deeply characterized in vivo, and then it links these uh, in vivo uh, uh, characteristics to uh, the in vitro investigation that again encompasses both bi um, biochemis biochemical assays and both structural and functional assays in terms of like uh, patch clamp and imaging. So in conclusion, um, this manuscript, this article is a very timely um, and interesting study that um, improves our mechanistic understanding of FPF. And as all of most uh, uh, impactful studies, it also uh, really drives the field and opens a number of questions that need to be uh, now addressed. I was very interesting, uh, interested in knowing, for example, that there is this female or sex difference in uh, FPF in the clinic. And so I guess a uh, probably a next step would be to try and investigate these sex differences better and really delving into the physiologic processes that are involved in this pathophysiology. Thank you very much, Eli. So now the paper is open for discussion, so don't be shy. Use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So we already have a few questions. Uh, so I, I used to work a lot on the L-type calcium channel as well. So there is a question by uh, Dan Johnson from the Open University in the UK, wondering whether we, you look at the calcium dependent inactivation and one way is to, to, to switch from EGTA to BAPTA, so slow calcium chelator to fast calcium chelator. Yeah, no, we, we didn't really look into that. Um, you know, we had EGTA in the pipette, but we didn't uh, do any experiments with that. That certainly, it, there's a logical reasoning to do that experiment, considering, you know, we see uh, elevation in calcium. There's probably elevated cleftal calcium, especially if we're seeing, um, you know, like I said, we do have evidence for, um, you know, aberrant ryanine receptor sort of leak. So the circumstances could be in place that there would be uh, enough elevate, you know, calcium elevation in the cleft that would be, you know, have an effect on calcium channel, uh, calcium dependent inactivation. Um, you know, I, I did a little bit, I looked at inactivation rates with uh, curve fitting, but I didn't, I don't feel like it uh, provided the resolution or really the experiment wasn't designed properly um, without the BAPTA. So interesting uh, thing to look at, but haven't. Um, the second question that Dan asks is about the female. So uh, Eleanor just mentioned that. Yeah. So um, clinically, this is uh, not, you know, there's a, a skew towards it being um, a female uh, disease. Um, we have, ex we had experiments ongoing in that laboratory looking specifically at female rats, not necessarily uh, redoing this set of experiments yet, but you know, it's something that is interesting to look at. We need to understand if there's some fundamental cellular difference in the females and males that could account for what's happening um, on the organism level. Um, and then the last part of that question that Dan asked, um, was about adrenergic receptor densities in the HEFPEF. And so, you know, certainly, okay, so that was like a, we, we have some information, right? We have physiological information on uh, the beta sensitive, beta adrenergic sensitivity um, trying. Uh, so the next step is to kind of figure out where in that pathway the defect 
lies. Um, we didn't look at the receptor density, you know, um, it's not, there's ways, there was certainly ways that we could do that. And, you know, there's, um, these receptors are internalized rapidly, um, you know, but in turn, we, we didn't, so we did run proteomics, a pre, very detailed proteomics analysis on these rats. Um, I can't get into too much of what we saw, but, you know, that, all I would say is, you know, that analysis won't pick up, uh, you know, surface density of the receptors because, you know, they'll be in the somal and being recycled. Um, so we want to do that, or that was something we wanted to do. We do definitely, definitely, mm -hmm. not getting into specifics, but we see um, changes in protein levels downstream of the receptors that will certainly uh, help to explain um, some of the physiology that we see, but we haven't necessarily checked the actual receptor levels yet. Anyway, I think actually, I just mentioned that a previous paper, uh, there there was a previous paper that looking at uh, the doll rats, and I think there was no evidence of uh, reduction in beta adrenergic receptor agonist. That was, um, okay. that was a paper, I think that we, it was like um, Nishio et al., a 2008 paper we found for that. Yeah, so I mean, there is reports that there was no reduction in the sensitivity um, or in the density there. Um, and then in terms of trying to tease out, you know, using specific agonists of uh, beta one versus beta two, or, or like, I, we, we didn't get into all that, obviously. After there is a nice work from uh, Julia Garlic in uh, London, yeah. showing the, the change in uh, the localization of the beta receptor. In the or art failure because it's easier. Yeah, that I mean that is her research is out there, right? I mean that is some. Uh, no, but it's opening new avenue, as I said uh, before. Yeah, no, I mean it's right. it's amazing that they can do that. I mean and get that sort of resolution with you know T two like you know just the. I think that there is probably very very like nano localization of these receptors that might be changed mm -hmm. and uh, lots of things. Author. So the next question is from Delphine Mika from Paris Saclay. Hello. Uh, so congratulations, nice presentation. Did you mod mod monitor ECG in this animal and what is the heart rate and the arrhythmia? Yeah, so yeah, we had yeah, we had several studies going on. We had several studies going on with these uh, rats in the lab. Um, one of them was very much focused on um, cardiac rhythm. Um, so I can't, I can't speak very specifically to their data. Um, but what I remember was that these rats have, you know, increased incidence. They have, you know, very, very severely uh, prolonged QT, right? Their herd density is like just very, very low. Um, that was, you know, published as another paper that I worked on in our lab and was published before mine. Um, they have, you know, increased incidence of uh, tachycardia, you know, they're, or well, they're more sensitive to uh, pace, pacing induced um, tachycardias. Um, in terms of, you know, at baseline, their heart rates were, I don't think statistically different. Um, obviously they have like, you know, super, crazy high blood pressure, but in terms of ECG, um, you know, prolonged QTC for sure, um, which opens them up to a lot of uh, ventricular arrhythmia. We even have, you know, one of the papers coming out of, that came out of the lab um, last year, two years ago, showed that, <clears throat> um, you know, these, these rats, we have spontaneous ventricular uh, tachycardia and they can die of it. So we had, there were some recordings like telemeter rats that were, had died of uh, VF. So yeah, I mean, it's certainly, it's something that we monitored and looked at and they do have elevated uh, propensity to arrhythmia. Okay, thank you. So there's uh, no more question. So there is no change in TQB, which is a, uh, New in terms of heart failure, did, did you check for the classic uh, culprit like uh, jointophilin two, bin one? What uh, what? I mean, so that? these things were meant where they were looked at in the proteomic analysis we did. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like part of one of the, you know, I 
I, it's not in the paper. So it is not something that I want to discuss too much, but it's something we looked at these. Um, I think that the T-tubules are in a state of change. I'm not saying that they are absolutely normal. Um, certainly there was some signal to show, you know, proteomically that there was disruption in the uh, amounts of some of these things you mentioned, bin one, junk to fill in, um, you know, on the front end at the, at the cleft, and then also on the uptake, um, you know, circa the phospholambam was up, which is strange considering that we saw no changes in the uptake. So, but in terms of the T-tubule, um, I think that there's a dynamic process going on. You know, Josh mentioned, uh, so it, these rats, you have to be really careful with them. So when I did the experiments, you have to echo them essentially right before the experiment to confirm their diastolic dysfunction, but really importantly, their systolic function, because um, they can sort of progress to a systolic phenotype as had been described in previous papers or systolic dysfunction phenotype. So it was, you know, very, uh, we had to select the rats very uh, cautiously when I was doing these experiments to make sure that we weren't introducing any rats with systolic dysfunction in the, any of the groups. Um, but with respect to the T-tubules, I mean, those rats, when I measured them, they all had high EF. And then when I stained the cells, they look much more similar to the control than they did in the ref. And, you know, so a William Lausch, his name you brought up before, um, as just recently publishing in J Physiol, um, you know, so he has some human tissue samples where he has evidence to suggest that um, there's maintained T tubulation in clinical hef pef patients um, and enhanced axial tubulation. So basically, like, a more tubulated cell. Now, in terms of the geometry and like how functional all that is, I mean, that's a great question, but um, just from the standpoint of staining the cells, you know, we feel like the, the T tubules at the whole level look pretty normal. Okay, thank you. So we've got five more minutes to okay. for the question. Um, but so I'm, there is a question by uh, Zhang Wei Zhang. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, similar. And what, what I would like to say for the T tubule and the question here is if you have access to STED, super resolution uh, confocal microscopy. There was a storm scope in our lab. Yeah. Um, anyway. And so, but we never, we, uh, our, our, our group didn't use that scope to really investigate these uh, things that are brought up and they're excellent. Uh, observations or suggestions, obviously. Um, you know, um, yeah, it would have been nice to do, to know about localization, mm. you know, but no. So Albano Meli, hello, from Montpellier, uh, asking about uh, modification of uh, Rhinodine receptor mm -hmm. 2, for example, can kinase 2? Yeah, okay, so let's see. Cam kinase phosphorylation. All right, so I, I sort of looked down the CAM kinase, uh, you know, the pathway to, because that was really was one of my leads for a while in terms of like, um, it made sense, right? Elevated calcium, elevated CAM kinase activity, and then, you know, elevated phosphorylation of brine interceptor, which we saw, but no, we, we didn't. We didn't really, uh, I think we measured it. We, we got inconclusive results and then we didn't get back to it. So it's, it's something to we, we put on a checklist somewhere and it would be very useful in understanding the physiology, I think, to know if, you know, I think that, so in terms of this basal change that's occurring, um, it, 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 there may be like, an, you know, there could be some elevated chemokinase phosphorylation activity that could explain some of it, didn't look at it or, you know, didn't have conclusive results. I would just add that, you know, one of the things that um, is so interesting to us about this is that when you have, you know, systolic dysfunction or HEFREF and you compare it to HEFPEF, you know, HEFREF is really defined, at least in, in the sorts of papers that uh, our group reading journal physiology read as sort of this, this defective excitation contraction coupling. Mm -hmm. 
really a, a phrase I like to come back to a lot that uh, um, I think I really feel like uh, I read it the first time in Anna Gomez's paper. And, uh, you know, this is the complete opposite. This is like souped up excitation contraction coupling, like yeah. everything is, is enhanced and, and whether it's, you know, uh, structural or whether it's uh, post-translational modification, um, it's, that's, kind of, that's kind of what we need to know. We need to look. And so all these uh, concepts of looking in detail at storm or, you know, high resolution scanning, um, looking very carefully at protein signaling pathways and so forth. There's really a lot to uncover still in this, in this uh, pathophysiology and with different models too, uh, to sh show what are common features in other models. And there are several other reasonable models out there that need to be investigated and compared. So I have a naive question, sorry. So is then art failure really like a continuum where you have you know, have path and you have some sort of maybe compensatory changes that then become maladaptive and you get a FRAF or is two completely different clinical entities? You know, um, historically, the, the, the teaching historically was that all dilated systolic heart failure patients uh, that had hypertension as an underlying uh, illness developed HEFPEF first, and then they burned out their HEFPEF and they progressed to HEFREF. Um, or really they started out with hypertrophy and then they proceeded to dilated heart failure with systolic dysfunction. And there's increasing lines of evidence now that they're really, let's just use hypertension as the example of an etiology. There are two separate populations and they're on a parallel track all along. So one group, never develops dis systolic dysfunction, but only the diastolic dysfunction in HEF-PEF, whereas the other group goes straight to systolic dysfunction without a hypertrophy phase. Um, and that's a new paradigm. Okay, thank you. So it's time to leave. So thank you very much to the panelists, to the audience. It was great. So, uh, it's every two weeks, not only on cardiac, but on all the physiology.